<clears throat> a number of Sundays ago, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we looked at the Israelites who were conned into um, the Moabite idol fe feast, and they worshipped idols and got into committing idolatry and immorality. Well, today we want to look at another sin in 1 Corinthians 10 that made God just as unhappy with Israel. Now, when I think about idolatry and immorality, it can't get much worse, can it? But in the same context, with the same importance, Paul mentions ingratitude or not being thankful. And a lot of times we think, well, that's not quite as bad as the rest of it. But Paul puts it in that context, and I think we should too. And 1 Corinthians 10 specifically states that we should beware what happened to Israel as an example and that we don't let the same thing happen to us. Ingratitude is very dangerous because it makes us susceptible to ever-increasing levels of unbelief, which is sin. We complain about our present lot in life, and that adds to the level of frustration in our daily life. We start focusing on what is wrong with everything in our lives rather than counting all the good things God does for us. Can anybody identify with that? I have a problem with that. Ingratitude tempts us always to see the negative in life and in others as well. Nobody seems to do it right. The kids don't clean well enough. My husband is never thoughtful enough. My wife does not appreciate what I do for her. On and on the list goes. And it seems to exponentially spiral out of control if it's not stopped. This morning, we want to look at three components of ingratitude to see how, how evil it really is. That is complaining, covetousness, and unbelief. Before we do that, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for your word. We are thankful that it guides us to the truth. And it also guides us to see our own hearts and to evaluate them in, in uh, comparison to your word. And we pray this morning that we would look at this area of ingratitude and be convicted for not being thankful enough. Father, we pray for change in our lives to be thankful to you for all you've done. We look at the Israelites and how they complained again and again, <clears throat> yet you had done so much for them. And Father, we want to take their example and be the opposite. We want to be thankful. So we pray that you would impress it upon our hearts this morning as we look into your word. We want to pray especially this morning for Landon. Father, we pray for your healing hand upon him. We ask that you give the surgeon's wisdom and the medical care that would be done for him is what can be best done for him. We pray for your help in our Savior's name. Amen. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 11. We're going to see what God has to say about <clears throat> this ingratitude. Numbers chapter 11, and we'll start with verse 1. Now the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some on the outskirts of the camp. The people therefore cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out. So the name of that place was called Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. The rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the garden and the garlic, and, and now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. Now the manna was like coriander seed and its appearance like that of bedellum. The people would go about and gather it and grind it between two millstones or beat it in the mortar and boil it in the pot and make cakes with it. And its taste was as the taste of cakes baked with oil. When the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. And then let's go to verse 18 of the same chapter. 
God telling uh, Moses, Say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat. For we were well off in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? And then a few more verses in chapter, same chapter, verse 31. Now there went forth a wind from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea, and let them fall beside the camp, about a day's journey on this side, and day's journey on the other side, all around the camp, about two cubits, that's a lot of meat, deep on the surface of the ground. The people spent all day and all night and all the next day and gathered the quail. He who gathered least gathered at least ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. While the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very severe plague. So the name of that place was called Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had been greedy. From Kibroth Hatava, the people set out for Hazroth, and they remained at Hazroth. Quite an event in the children of Israel's history. Complaining is to, to express discontent, to gripe, or to grumble. And Israel complained a lot, didn't they? They complained about their circumstances in verse 1. The heat, the dirt, they were desolate, no shade, it was ugly. They complained about their food, the same old manna day after day. No meat, no cucumbers, no melons, no leeks. Our appetite is gone. It says in Numbers 11.1, 1, Now the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. They weren't very smart because they were complaining about the Lord. And it says in Numbers 14.27, God saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Israel was complaining against God. You know, a lot of times when we complain, we don't think about it as complaining against God. And some of them may have or may not. But that's what it is, isn't it? We're complaining about our circumstances in life. And Israel tested God. They forgot all that he'd given to them, and all they wanted was more. And he had provided for them. And they were insinuating that God led them into the wilderness to die there. And they could have stayed in Egypt to die of starvation. Basically, they were questioning God's willingness and ability to provide bread and meat. These complaints were awful, but because it, it, it called into question the very sovereignty of God, who He was, and His love for them. They were doubting His power. They were doubting His love. And God takes His character very strongly and very seriously, even if Israel did not. Jude 6 talks about these people. They were grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. Well, how does that apply to us? Surely it doesn't. It does. We complain about our circumstances, the weather. It's too hot. It's too cold. It rains too much. The location we're in, the politics etc. We complain sometimes about the lack of provision we have. Small house, no SUV, not what others have. We complain about people, our boss, the elders, our spouse, our brother or sister in the Lord. We, we complain about our lot in life. We're too ugly, too short, too tall, too shy, too sick, and so on. And we compare. But we have just somewhat what others have, and we want the same. Christians test God when they complain about what they <clears throat> excuse me, do not have, rather than be thankful for what they do have. Christians test God when they complain about what they do not have, rather than thankful, being thankful for what they do have. We have that problem, don't we? The basis of complaints usually is discontentment. All people want is more. It's covetousness, lusting after what others have. 
And complaining becomes habit forming so that we almost take complaining for granted. It becomes a very poor part of our life. And then we have the problem of pros prosperity. People tend to look at what they do not have rather than what they have. <clears throat> Israel here sounds like America today, forgetting who has really blessed them. Those who have plenty want more and complain about what they do not have. God doesn't promise, quote, prosperity to Christians, does he? His only son was not prosperous in the eyes of the world. How can we expect anything different? Christians are exhorted to not complain or grumble. It says in Philippians 2, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Very clear command of the Lord. Do all things without grumbling. Complaining is a poor testimony to those around us. When we complain, we question God's grace, His goodness, His love, His sovereignty. So we have to be careful and realize what we're doing when we complain. Christians should be content in whatever circumstances they are in, Paul says in Philippians 4. And I think something we should realize that complaining supplants the joy of thanksgiving. You don't see people who, who grumble and complain a lot are the same ones that give thanks a lot, do you? We want to be those who give thanks rather than those who are complaining. Israel complained when they should have been thanking God for what he had done. And Christians can fall into the same trap and are warned against doing so. 1 Corinthians 10 that we read says, Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Complaining reveals an attitude of ingratitude. Complaining reveals an attitude of ingratitude. Think about that. That complaining, there's more to it. And we're going to see even more. Well, you know what fuels ingratitude? Complaining is the obvious result of it. But covetousness fuels ingratitude. The definition of covetousness is greed, wanting more than what you have. Israel longed for what they had while they were enslaved in Egypt. The fish, the melons, the leeks, the onions. It says in Psalm 106, commentary, com uh, talking about the same instance, it says, but they craved intensely in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Their covetousness was craving intensely for these things they did not have from Egypt. Note their twisted thinking. The melons are more important than freedom to worship God. Does our thinking get twisted sometimes? What's really important to us? The melons and the leeks and the garlic and so on were more important than worshiping God. It says that the rabble among us had greedy desires. They were weeping for meat. Consider our American culture. We tend to be quite covetous. In fact, to most people, the good life is more important than the freedom to worship. And there's this idea that everybody deserves to have what everybody else has. That's covetousness in our society. The American dream is a big house with two fancy cars and a big boat. The American dream is not to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And that is what we should, as Christians, desire with all our heart. What a contrast that is. This inheritance story illustrates the attitude of many covetous people in our day. <clears throat> a man noticed his friend was sad and asked why. The friend replied he had a big problem that was hard to deal with. Three weeks ago, he received 150000 as an inheritance from an aunt who passed away. Two weeks ago, he inherited 4000 400000 from his grandmother who passed away. One week ago, he received 75000 from an old friend as an appreciation of their fellowship and friendship. The man asked the friend, so what's your problem? The friend replied, I haven't received a single dime this week. And sometimes as you think about it, that's us. It's all we want is more. I haven't received a single dime 
this week. Covetousness becomes habit forming and the goal of life. Christians should not covet. The 10th commandment says you should, shall not covet. And then Ephesians 5 is very revealing. It says, for, you, for this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God, Ephesians 5, 5. It points out in this passage, those who are covetous are idolizing wealth and things. And certainly God hates that. Um, Colossians 3, 5 says the same, same thing. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immor immorality, impurity, passion, and evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. You know, a lot of times we don't think about how sinful some of these things are, but God makes it very clear that covetousness is idolatry. And we need to look at our own lives and say, are we really thankful as we should be? Are there things that are keeping us from being thankful because we have desires for things that God has not given us? Very important for us to consider that. Christians should not covet. Covetousness results in debt. It results in not giving. It results in not depending upon God. It results in ingratitude. We need to look at our lives and see and make sure that we are not covetous. It's a bad testimony as it undermines God's provision as insufficient. Covetousness is unchristlike, as he coveted nothing. Covetousness is ungodly and is evidence of not trusting God, isn't it? Sometimes we wonder, why am I not closer to God? Well, here's one problem to put a finger on when we're thinking or trusting in riches or the things of this earth. We're certainly not trusting in God and we can't draw close to God if we're not trusting in Him. Covetousness is ungodly and evidence of not trusting God. Well, another aspect of covetousness is unbelief. As we talked about a little bit, let's turn to Psalm 78. This is further commentary on the children of Israel. And it reveals more than we realize from uh, Exodus. Psalm 78 and verse 18. And in their heart, they put God to the test by asking food according to their desire. Then they spoke against God and said, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that waters gushed out and streams were overflowing. Can he give bread also? Will he provide meat for his people? Therefore the Lord heard and was full of wrath. And a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also mounted against Israel. Because, listen to this, because they did not believe in God, and did not trust in his salvation. Yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna upon them to eat and gave them food from heaven. Man did eat the bread of angels, and he sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he directed the south wind, when he rained meat upon them like dust, even winged fowl from the sand of the seas. Then he let them fall in the midst of their camp, round about their dwellings, so that they ate and were filled and their desire he gave to them. Before they had satisfied their desire while the food was in their mouths, the anger of God rose against them and killed some of their stoutest ones and subdued the choice men of Israel. In spite of all this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wonderful works. So he brought their days to an end of futility and their years in sudden terror. When he killed them, then, he sought them, then they sought him and returned and searched diligently for God. They remembered that God was their rock, the most high God, their redeemer. But they deceived him with their mouth and lied to him with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast toward him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. And often he restrained his anger and did not arouse all his wrath. Thus remember that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and does not return. 
how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Again and again they tempted him, tempted God, and pained the Holy One of Israel. It's quite a commentary, isn't it, on the children of Israel and their complaining. And this passage refers back to the Numbers 11 passage that we've already read about Israel complaining, and it talks about their unbelief. It refers to that complaining as unbelief in God. In verse 22 of 11, it says, Israel did not believe in God and did not trust in His salvation. And it was obvious by their complaining and their <clears throat> ingratitude. It said they tested God by asking for more food according to desire as they were ungrateful what they had already received from God. Israel tested God and by not trusting Him and being ungrateful for His provision. Murmuring and complaining are bad because they question the sovereignty and goodness of God. Ingratitude is so dangerous as it makes us susceptible to ever-increasing unbelief, which is sin. Ingratitude becomes unbelief. Israel did not trust God's ability to provide after He had already provided. You can see how their ingratitude, ingratitude turned into unbelief. They refused to acknowledge for what He had already, already done for them. They did not trust His care and goodness. Unbelief leads to testing God. The definition of testing God is pushing God to the limit, trying to see how much one can get out of Him and how much they can get by, with, by before Him without reaping the consequences. It's kind of like a child with their parents. Sometimes that child does, does what they are told not to do to see if the parent will react or enforce their word by punishment. Perhaps a child is told to quit throwing a fit and almost daring the parent to react. And certainly parents do react and they realize that they don't get by with testing. Well, Israel did not get by with testing either because not only did he strike some down then, but remember, nobody got into the land of Canaan except for two people. That was God's judgment on them for their unbelief and their ingratitude. It says in Psalm 106 concerning Israel, they quickly forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but craved intensely in the wilderness and tempted God in the de desert. So he gave them the request, but sent a wasting disease among them. Unbelief leads to testing God, and testing God leads to judgment. How can we apply that today? Well, the application is our ingratitude is unbelief. Instead of being grateful for what we have, so often we tend to wish for more. We get into serious debt because God hasn't provided enough for us. We're not thankful for our spouse as God's provision, provision wishing for someone else. We're not thankful for our lifestyle, wishing for more. We're not thankful to God for the traits or gifts we have, instead wishing for other traits or gifts. Gratitude leads to not, ingratitude leads to not trusting God. And we need to be aware of that in our lives um, so we can combat that with being thankful for what God has given to us. Israel had much to be thankful for. God's deliverance, His provision, His guidance, He was very good to them. But they didn't see that, did they? They did momentarily, shortly after the deliverance from Egypt, they sang a song of thankfulness. But that did not last. In contrast, David was so grateful to God that he assigned Asaph to give thanks to God as a full-time vocation. May we look at David's example and follow that. Thanksgiving was so important to David. He had this guy, Asaph, 100% of the time, I presume his working hours anyway, giving thanks to God. What a vocation. You know, that's a vocation we need to get used to. Because guess what we're going to be doing in eternity? Giving thanks to God for all eternity, for what He's done. So let's start that habit now of giving thanks to God. 
So important. So many things to give God thanks for. Whether it be Christ Jesus, our Redeemer, our salvation, other salvation. Mary just had her brother come to know the Lord. We can give thanks for that, certainly, can't we? Christ's victory over sin and death, eternity in heaven, and our, our inheritance in Christ, the Word of God, God's faithfulness and mercy, answered prayer, wisdom, God's creation and provision we'd be thankful for, our family, our spouse, our friends, so many blessings to be thankful for. Remembering that God has what God has done affects our attitude and our appreciation for what He has done. We are told in the Word of God many times to have thanksgiving. It says in uh, Philippians, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known to God. Now I started thinking about my own prayers. <clears throat> I have this whole long list of supplication. And it's a valid list, whether it's somebody's soul, um, someone to go on for the Lord, or whatever. It's a, it's a decent list. But you know, I find out there's only a few items over here. We need long lists on both sides, don't we? So pray to God that you will learn to be more thankful, as I pray the same. It says in Colossians 4, Continue earnestly in prayer, being diligent in it with thanksgiving. It's easier to be diligent in it with thinking about the things we need or others need, but with thanksgiving. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, Therefore I exert first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Whenever you see prayer mentioned, not only is it supplication, but it's thanksgiving. Psalm 116 says, To thee I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. God views it as a spiritual sacrifice. Gratitude is going to be heaven's theme. We might as well get used to it now. Colossians 2.7 says, Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. That should be us. It's God's will. In 1 Thessalonians 5, He says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will, for you in Christ Jesus. God's will is totally opposite that of what Israel did. They complained. They were ungrateful. We as believers are to be grateful and to give thanks to our God for what He has done. Gratitude should be part of our life every day. It says in uh, Colossians, Paul puts a real emphasis on gratitude in Colossians chapter 3. Listen to this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you and with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him for Jesus um, to God the Father giving thanks to Him through God the Father. Paul makes it very clear, thanksgiving should be a very important part of our life. There's a story of Matthew Henry, who's a man of God, and he was known for his gratitude. Matthew Henry, the famous theological scholar, was once accosted by thieves and robbed of his wallet. He wrote these words in his diary, Let me be thankful. First, because I've never been robbed before. Second, because although they took my wallet, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it wasn't much. Fourth, because I, it was I who was robbed, not I who was robbing. Wow. That's important, isn't it? We can be thankful for so many things. You know, some, a lot of us would suffer losing our wallet. Oh, the end of the world would be here. Well... Matthew Henry had the right attitude as he praised God um, for what God had given him and the life of change that he had because of Jesus Christ. Psalm 107 says, Let them give thanks to the Lord for His loving kindness and for His wonders to the sons of men. We need to give thanks to the Lord for what He's done for us. Gratitude should be a characteristic 
of God's children. Gratitude should be a characteristic of God's children. Is it a characteristic of our life? Well, we've seen that God was extremely displeased with Israel's complaining and unbelief to the point he struck down some, and he didn't allow any of those people into the promised land except for two. We've got many Christians behaving like Israel, complaining about their lot in life instead of being thankful for the blessings God has given them. Ingratitude is unbelief, leading to testing God by seeing how much we can get out of Him. Gratitude is a priority for believers. God's poured His blessings out upon us, and we should thank Him often for that. Gratitude leads to greater trust in God. Gratitude leads to greater joy and contentment. Sometimes Christians ask, why don't I have the joy I should? Well, we're not counting the blessings that God has given to us. If we do that, we will have more joy and we'll have more contentment. Paul says in Colossians 2, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. You want to walk with the Lord? Thank Him. And you begin to walk with Him. By God's grace and to His glory, may we be overflowing with gratitude 